Now to our second reading from 1 Corinthians 12 on this day of Pentecost. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifest, manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. And there's going to be a list of gifts here. This isn't an exhaustive list. These are just some of the things that get named because these are some of the activities that people at Corinth were arguing about. Who makes, you know, who's more important. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom. And to another, the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of powerful deeds. To another, prophecy. To another, the discernment of spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit who allots to each one individually just as the Spirit chooses. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. May God bless the reading of Holy Scripture. Thanks be to God. During e the Easter season, we had a special art installation hanging here above the chancel. This liturgical art piece was assembled from the paper cranes that you all had made, symbolizing our prayers for peace and justice, and our own Steve Steinecker designed all those um, paper cranes into this beautiful uh, dove that, that hung here. We uh, took that installation down a couple of weeks ago, not easily, I might add, and we did our level best to try to store it in a way that it could be used again, but don't hold your breath on that. We'll see next year. Today, as you can see, we worship under dove and flames this beautiful banner, reminding us that we are people of the Spirit. Several of us made a first attempt at hanging this banner last Sunday after worship. There were a few technical snafus, things did not go as planned, but finally this dove flew into place on Monday afternoon, and I'm glad it did. Images of dove and flame remind us who we are on this special day on the church calendar called Pentecost. When Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River, the Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove. And then when the risen Jesus poured out the Spirit on his followers, a lavish, prodigal, excessive outpouring, the Spirit came like wind and flame. Like this dove above me, God's Spirit dives and swerves and banks through our community, singing us all into postures of open, flexible, expectant wonder. The flames flicker and spark, warming our hearts, wavering to wind, dancing and dressed in Blues, yellows, oranges, and reds, dove flight and flame flicker become for us the Spirit's invitation to a mood of nimble cooperation, creative and unexpected coalition building, and hopefully playful surprise. This Spirit, poured out, tumbling through us and entangling us all together, can never ever be calculated or controlled. We can only chase after it in a game of perpetual catch-up to the fresh ways that God is always blessing and healing us and the world around us. We're just now beginning to glimpse some of these fresh ways that God's Spirit is coming to expression in our lives, and that's what I want us to reflect on a bit this morning. Our reading from Numbers 11 that Jonah read for, for us, that's a quirky little tale. Um, I bet some of you were hearing that for the first time or had forgotten hearing it. Up until this point in the story, God's Spirit has rested squarely on Moses, Israel's leader. You might remember in the story of the Exodus that it was Moses who was called up on the holy mountain to receive the tablets of the law. No one else was allowed on the mountain, only Moses. But now in this story, 
the spirit that belonged exclusively to Mo Moses gets shared with other of Israel's leaders. It wasn't a power grab. It wasn't a rebellious uprising. In fact, it's God who is the one who takes some of the spirit that was with Moses and put it on the 70 elders. When the 70 elders receive the spirit, they begin to prophesy. That is, they start acting like spirit-filled leaders, singing and dancing and announcing with gladness God's powerful deeds in the world. But then it doesn't last. They prophesy for a few minutes and then they run out of steam. The story helps us imagine a spillover of God's spirit from just one authority figure to then lots of others. But not all that much spirit spills over in this story. Just a little bit. And when some of the other Israelites, this was so unusual, when some of the other Israelites saw these elders acting like it wasn't just Moses, but that they too had the spirit, they were alarmed. In fact, it's Moses' young sidekick, Joshua, and thank you for the commentary there, Jonah, son of Nun. Uh, it's Joshua who hollers out, Moses, make them quit. They shouldn't be doing this. Only one leader is in charge. Only one authority figure has the Spirit. For communities that live by the Spirit, this story suggests that this question, who's in charge here, never gets a very good answer. And then here's what Moses says to Joshua. I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. This story, even though it narrates a one-time intermittent sharing of the spirit's activity, becomes a lively part of Israel's imagination. From here on, Israel's writings are filled with the longing for a time when God's spirit will be shared with everyone and not just with a few people for a few minutes. That dream comes to expression on Pentecost when the early followers of Jesus testified that the Spirit did in fact spill over, pour out, and come as a gift from their risen Lord. From then on the Spirit was seen as the Spirit of the crucified and risen Christ who gives it as gift. The Spirit is loose, fresh, and free and dances playfully here and there, blowing around and through all things like the wind, hard to pin down and impossible to predict. To our continuing amazement, this spirit can be a gift given to us in baptism that flickers and fills us with the energy that we have come to name faith, hope, and love. The sacred stories that both Jews and Christians tell imagine a movement, a shift in how the spirit works, a kind of development away from a picture of the Spirit as the exclusive possession of those in charge towards something much more inclusive. Away from an, an obsession with locating authority in one special person at the top in charge towards an unregulated, unruly eruption of leadership and gifted capacities in people of all different ages, all different backgrounds, all different capacities, and all genders. Now, when we're young and growing, if you're three or four, a healthy respect for the authority of trustworthy adults is appropriate and important. It might keep you from running in the street, and that's good. But to be honest, part of life involves growing up and growing past that need for authority figures. Over time, our expectations about leadership, about authority, about community life, and about the spirit begins to become more unruly, more disorganized, more lively, and I think more exciting. Now, it's true that God's Spirit is always unpredictable and unruly, but there are some telltale signs to watch for when God's Spirit is weaving its way among a community of people. For starters, we should be realistic. The Spirit never arrives and immediately fixes all our problems. It didn't happen that way in Holy Scripture. It doesn't happen that way now. The Spirit never magically untangles all our knots. But it does come as a spirit that will make trouble in any form of community life that's blo that blocks some people from flourishing. When the Spirit comes, it does put a match to any way of organizing our lives that categorizes people, scales people, orders people by importance or alleged status. When people begin dreaming in God's Spirit, living by the Spirit, something shifts 
And we start to see everything around us in a new light. Those people formerly considered little or marginal or outside or unimportant, these folks take center stage in the life of the community. And it's beautiful. Here's how Paul puts it in his letter to the Corinthians, quote, There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in every way, in every one, it's the same God at work. And if it's the same Spirit, the same Lord, the same God at work to gift some with leadership skills and others with different kinds of skills, skills at making things with their hands, or skills teaching young people, or skills tending to the sick. If the same Spirit has bestowed all these different kinds of lives and personalities and capacities and interests within the community, then, friends, it would be absolutely silly to view some people as more important than others. So there are very concrete, very practical lessons that we can learn from this teaching about how we as a congregation ought to order our lives. Everyone in this congregation has a life lit from within by the Holy Spirit. That's just how it is. So every single one of us are equally valuable, equally loved, equally important, and equally authorized to participate fully in the life, worship, witness, and leadership of our life, of our community life. Some of you are good with money. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're part of this congregation. We need you. But you're no more important to this congregation than people who are good at fixing windows or baking pies, or writing notes, or playing with children. Some people are charismatic extroverts. They're well-connected. They know how to network. They're prominent members of the community. We have some of those people, and I'm glad we do. I'm glad you're here. But those people are no more important to our congregation than people who read to kids in schools, who mow the lawns of a neighbor, who sing in the choir, who volunteer in our feeding ministries, or who just simply devote themselves to praying for other people. You could go on and on, but you get the idea, right? So, friends, let's begin dreaming of a life together where God's Spirit shapes our lives more deeply than the news we watch, the social media feeds we follow, and the party we vote for, or the income bracket we belong to. In this transitional time when Second Presbyterian is dreaming about the work that God has called us to do in the next chapter of our lives, let's remember what we're learning today on Pentecost, that the good ideas for what's next will not come from me as your pastor, nor will they come predominantly from your other staff, gifted and bright and wonderful as they are, nor is it likely that your elders, those we have ordained specifically to guide and govern the worship and ministry of the congregation, nor is it likely that they will have a corner on all of the best ideas. The dreams that come for new ministries, new forms of service, new ways of engaging with and blessing our wider community, all these good ideas will instead be hatched by people with spirit-sponsored gifts that enable them to see something fresh that the rest of us haven't yet seen. And these fresh, flickering expressions of spirit aren't just descriptions of church life. They're signs and clues of the way God's new realm is taking shape in a variety of other spheres, in family life, in cities, and neighborhoods, and economies. In our reading from Corinthians, the Apostle Paul imagines a way forward out of all the dead-end ways we've arranged our lives into something much more exciting. He doesn't necessarily develop these brief and suggestive cues, but perhaps we can. According to Paul, God's Spirit is at work to rupture the boundaries that separate people. God's Spirit unsettles and dismantles the creaky, questionable ways we've organized our lives, arranged our resources, and allocated status. For Paul, Pentecost is about redistributing power and resources in more interesting ways. He puts it like this, quote, For we were all baptized by one Spirit, so as to form one body. And then here are the suggestive clues. Whether Jews or Greeks, there's Paul's suggestion for us to develop a spirituality able to reflect critically on issues of ethnicity, race, identity, and belonging. Whether Jews or Greeks, and then here's the next suggestive clue, whether slave or free, 
That's the invitation from Paul to develop a spirituality that addresses economic inequality and a more equitable sharing of resources. Now, fleshing out these tantalizing clues from Paul might help us imagine a Pentecostal spirituality for the 21st century. This is not a spirituality closed and cloistered. It's a way of life oriented to dreaming about working towards, in the language of our reading, working towards the common good. I've talked before about the novelist Ocean Vuong. Um, his 2019 novel was entitled, On Earth, We're Briefly Gorgeous. Vuong's family immigrated to the U.S. from Vietnam when he was just two years old. And so his entire life here in the U.S., he has grown up as an outsider. He's Buddhist. He's queer. He's in an, raised in an illiterate family with a mother who spoke no English. He shared stories about his upbringing and his mother in an interview with Krista Tippett. His mother worked her whole life in a nail salon in Hartford, Connecticut, and so did other members of the extended family, and so did Ocean himself when he was younger. And the first time his mother ever got to hear her son read in public was at the Mark Twain house in Hartford. She still didn't understand English, so she didn't understand what he was saying or what anyone else was saying as her son read from his now famous published work. Vuong says in the interview, quote, and of course, she doesn't understand the English, but she was so proud just to see her son up there in the spotlight, even a small spotlight, and I went back to her after I read. People clapped, and they stood, and it was all lovely, and I went back to her, and she was sobbing. And being the dutiful son, I said, what did I do? What happened? Are you okay? And she said, no, no, I just never thought I'd live to see all these old white people clapping for my son. <laughs> it bothered Ocean that his mom saw this as some sort of victory for him, and he didn't understand quite what she meant. He didn't understand why it was so moving for her that white people were clapping for him and honoring and recognizing her just for being his mother. Vaughn continues, quote, the next day I was at the salon again with her. Her makeup's all off. She put her nice dress away that she wore to the reading. She took her earrings off and right out of the gate in the early morning, I saw her and watched her kneel at the pedicure chair before one old white woman after another. It was so humbling because I thought, finally, she was below their eye level for so many years and for one brief moment they saw her face to face as an equal. And then I got it. Friends, that's Pentecost. To be seen, to be recognized, to be accepted and loved, that's what all of us want. And the Spirit is turning you and me into the kind of people who are learning to see, to recognize, to accept and value those we had previously overlooked, ignored, neglected, relegated, or discounted in some way. I'm a theologian, so I like fancy theological terms, but I don't really care if you ever use the word Pentecost. You don't have to know that this is the liturgical holy day that follows Easter. You don't need to know that red is the customary color for vestments, you know, in the sanctuary. But I do want you to know this, that God has poured out the Holy Spirit upon you and upon me and upon the whole world. God's Spirit is loose in the world, blowing blessings around like the wind, flickering freshness into stale structures, singing the whole world into a shared and inclusive hope. This is the spirit that weaves us together, energizing us for the work that Jesus began to do during his earthly life, creating hospitable communities of welcome where everyone gets a seat, creating communities big and small where no one is denied dignity, no one is ashamed or left out, no one is second class, and no one gets exalted higher than others. The spirit is flame, flickering and energizing. The spirit is dove descending, alighting on us so gently, oftentimes we don't even notice it. The spirit is breath and wind, filling our lungs and bracing us all as we walk forward into these new lives of faith, hope, and love. So take a breath in. Here it is. Breathe out. There it goes. Amen.